Struggle with Intermittent Streams by Ross Van der Horst. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, yeah, I'm excited to be here today to talk about really the next step in what happens to these fish in intermittent rivers and what may be driving their survival. So now, uh, Pablo talked about non-lethal effects. I'm here to talk about some of the lethal effects and I've been focusing my work on the endangered coho salmon, uh, specifically in the Russian River in Northern California, in that area right around Santa Rosa. And I first want to thank uh, Ted Grantham and Stephanie Carlson, my, my postdoc advisors at UC Berkeley. And I've also been working closely with um, Mariska Obedinsky and Sarah Nossman Pierce from the California Sea Grant. And they've been very instrumental in providing this really uh, broad data set for me to analyze. So we here are really no strangers to the, the fact that freshwater biodiversity is in decline. And this is occurring globally where 37% of our freshwater species are extinct or, or threatened. Uh, this is especially affecting our migratory fish species, fish, fish that travel long distances along a river or that migrate from the ocean into our freshwater ecosystems. We've seen a 41% decline in those fish species uh, abundance. And we're no stranger to this here in California, where 45% of our salmonids risk extirpation within the next 50 years. And we already have uh, 14 species of critical concern, including this um, coho salmon here. So one of the major drivers of these declines is the alteration of natural flow regimes. Uh, again, this is occurring not only globally, where we see a widespread decrease in discharge, and this is predicted to become more prevalent uh, within the next 50 years. Um, one of the major implications here is that a lot of these streams that are facing reduced discharges is where we are all living. So 41% of our world's population lives within these river basins that are underwater stress. So this is really that conflict between water for, for drinking, water for agriculture, and also water for other ecosystem services such as biodiversity, including these endangered species. In California, it's expected to see, we're expected to see a really big increase in the frequency and intensity of not only extreme wet seasons, but also extreme dry seasons. So this is new modeling evidence showing the increase in frequency of extremely dry seasons that we're expected to see here in Northern California over the next 50 to 70 years. And this is really going to have consequences on our biodiversity, where we're expected to see up to 75% loss of local fish biodiversity in these streams that are, are, are having reduced discharges. To circumvent this extinction process, we're really spending millions of dollars to, to promote the populations of these endangered species. And this is just a map of current NOAA fisheries projects that are restoring coho salmon and steelhead populations along the Pacific coast. And I'm going to be focusing today along that central area along the Russian River and, and one of these um, restoration projects in particular. <clears throat> so part of the enhancement or, or restoration process is doing habitat enhancement, things like fish passages, um, reducing fragmentation. Uh, creating side channels and large wooden debris to help promote a habitat for these fish species. Specifically in the, the Russian River, they've been augmenting uh, the natural populations of these endangered species um, by growing fish in, um, in, in aquaria and then releasing those fish out into the wild to see if they actually survive. So they've released over a million fish in the Russian River uh, that were hatchery grown uh, each one of these fish has a pit tag in there, so researchers are able to follow these fish throughout uh, the summer period when really that's the, the bottleneck for survival for these fish as, as the streams dry down. They're able to monitor not only where these fish move, but also whether or not they, they die or not. And a lot of this stream restoration work related to endangered species is going on in these intermittent streams. So streams that uh, stop flowing at some point of the year or sometimes completely lose surface flow. So this is, yeah, as you can imagine, really risky business. We're spending millions of dollars on these restoration programs. And we're doing this in 
really the most dynamic freshwater habitat we have is these, these intermittent streams where there's um, always some sort of fluctuation between the amount of water um, and the time of year where that can be very limiting for these um, endangered species. But it's important to do it in these intermittent streams because that's where the majority of salmon and steelhead are, are, are really produced in, in Central California. So the objective of my, of my talk today is I just want to describe the stream flow conditions that we've seen in the Russian River Basin between 2011 and 2017. And if you're familiar with uh, that period of time here in California, uh, there was a, a really historic drought that occurred between 2012 and 2016. And I want to show you some estimates of over-summer juvenile survival for fish that were um, hatchery raised and then released into the wild. And then I'm going to talk about some of the key environmental correlates or variables that were uh, controlling that survival. So looking more specifically at this uh, project in the Russian River, uh, you can see Santa Rosa here. I'm going to be focusing on four tributaries, Dutch Mill Creek, Green Valley Creek, Mill Creek, and Grape Creek in the upper part of the watershed. Within each one of those tributaries, we had eight reaches. And then within each one of those reaches, we had anywhere from five to 15 stream pools where fish were released and then monitored. Uh, we monitored their survival over the study period. And like I mentioned, we we're working with a data set that's between 2011 and 2017. So as these fish were released, they were all individually pit tagged. And then throughout the summertime, um, um, field technicians went out and they did some wanding. So they were, they were monitoring the, the position of those fish within the reach and also whether or not they continued to move and, and thus uh, indicated that they were still surviving during the stream flow. So we used the program MARC to come up with survival estimates. This was a MARC recapture technique and that also taken into account the, the potential for fish to move from one pool where they were released to a different pool. Um, so we have survival estimates throughout that summer period starting in, in June until October for uh, those different stream reaches and all those individual pools. That's what really separates this um, data set from, from, from some of the others is that we have really pool level, precise level um, survival estimates for coho salmon whereas um, previous studies have worked at the river reach So I want to take you through the flow conditions that we've seen now. This visualization isn't quite as pretty as what we saw yesterday, but um, the point here is uh, to look at flow um, along, the river, uh, along the Russian River between 2011 and 2017. And you can see how um, mean stream flow uh, per month, which is uh, on that y-axis, uh, over time at those different months really decreased between 2012 and 2016. So we show a, a strong effect of that drought <coughs> period. Now looking at the effects on cumulative coho salmon survival, I plotted cumulative survival on the y-axis over the, the seven year period that we were working with. And I'm focusing just on two stream reaches, Dutch Bill Creek and Mill Creek. And then each one of those, uh, or excuse me, two tributaries, and each one of those has an upstream and a downstream reach. Um, and you can see differences in those two tributaries in cumulative survival. So um, in the upper graph in Dutchville, we can see cumulative survival um, oftentimes dropped below 50%, whereas in Mill Creek, it was oftentimes, or most of the time, above the 50%. And I think that's important just to show how much heterogeneity there is um, in our stream channels, um, even during that drought period. We can see that even during those extreme drought years, 2012 to 2016, that we were still able to maintain some survival in these coho salmon. And I think an important, really important thing to point out is that these stream sites were selected to try to maximize juvenile coho salmon survival because we're spending a lot of money on these resources. We want these fish to survive. So um, there was a lot of work done um, before these fish were actually released into these stream pools to to really maximize that cumulative survival. And I, can, I think this graph helps show that. So during the, the study period, we can see also that um, fish movement changed a lot between 2011 
uh, to 2017, you can see a, a strong decrease in the amount of fish that were able to move from one pool to another pool, especially during those drought years. And this, what this shows is that these fish become stranded in these isolated pools. As, well, as flow decreases, um, they're no longer able to, to track environmental conditions and they, and be, they be actually become trapped in these isolated pools. So we have a really large data set, over 800 data points, looking at um, what is controlling fish survival in these individual habitat units. And we looked at really a host of different environmental factors that could be influencing it. And if you look at this graph, uh, graph here, listed on the left side is all the different variables that we looked at. There's a total of 11, and their effect on um, coho salmon survival. So if the point is on the right side, it had a positive effect on coho salmon survival, whereas on the left, it had a negative effect on coho salmon survival. And we can see is that antecedent precipitation had the strongest effect on juvenile coho salmon survival. That's just the amount of spring rain that occurred. Whereas on the lower side, what was negatively affecting coho salmon survival was um, correlation between the percent of the watershed that was in croplands. Now we can't necessarily say that this was um, what was influencing salmon survival, but there was a strong correlation between survival and those watersheds that had a high percentage of croplands. And we can look further into individual factors that might be influencing survival. These are partial dependence plots. And what these are doing is predicting the survival based on one environmental factor. Uh, here we're showing days of disconnection and antecedent precipitation. If we were to kept, keep all those other environmental factors at their mean level, so we can see a decrease as, as the days these isolated pools um, are disconnected in, in salmon survival, and we can see an increase because of that spring precipitation in salmon and just looking at a couple more, we have percent croplands had a strong decrease in survival and also coho density. So my title actually, I think in the, the abstract was, was abiotic factors. And we did look at one factor and found that coho density or the number of coho within those individual pools um, negatively influenced salmon survival. So teasing apart these different factors that are influencing survival has um, some important management implications. For example, we found that pool depth and, and water temperature can influence salmon survival. So this points to the fact that we should use habitat restoration um, um, measures that can, that can influence that. So something like large woody debris can help create deeper pools and, and cooler water. So this was really directing management actions based on that large data set I was working with. Another thing that we've been able to do in the Russian River um, is do emergency flow releases to try to maintain pool volume um, in, in adequate dissolved oxygen conditions because we know those are limiting factors for survival. And also this might help um, identify when to uh, go out and actually move physically these salmon from stream pools that are beginning to dry to more uh, to stream pools that have better conditions. And I think uh, identifying thresholds using this data set that really to tell managers when to um, do these actions will be important. So I'm still working with this large data set. We need to do some more model validation. We, we, I want to bring in more biological correlates, so things like um, um, the density of other fish species, potentially predators for these coho salmon that could be influencing survival. And I also want to look at what, what's happening downstream. So when do these salmon uh, actually out-migrate and, and whether or not they, they do out-migrate. That's the next kind of step in understanding the, the whole survival process of these hatchery-raised salmon. Thank you. You wait for a microphone, please. It's coming. Thank you. How did the flow releases uh, increase the dissolved oxygen? That's what that's from the in your slides. Yeah. So that, some of that work was done in Porter Creek, which is not um, the data that I, I was presenting here. 
but they do, they have tracked um, dissolved oxygen during those emergency flow releases, and they see that it can increase above a, a threshold that influences salmon survival. So it can increase it uh, above five milligrams per liter where, where they would expect salmon to be able to survive, or, or that it wouldn't be limiting for salmon survival. It's largely the ripples that oxygen yeah, during the flow releases, I think one of their main goals is to try to reconnect those isolated pools and to create some water flowing over those riffles so it, it will become naturally oxygenated. So looking at about this stream intermittency and then the connection between or among the pools, there is a surface water flow and then also there might be some connectivity through the hyperic or uh, surface flows. Have, have you guys ever looked at that factor and then how that might affect the survival of juvenile salmon or any other fish? Yeah, so there has been some work looking at the potential influx of groundwater into these stream pools. Um, one of the things that we did look at in this data set was just the composition of the stream bed, whether it was alluvial or bedrock, because that would indicate if it's alluvial, potentially there's a, a connection to the groundwater. And that was an important factor in controlling salmon survival, but I think that's something that we need to look further into is is those groundwater inputs and their potential to not only maintain water in those isolated pools, but also um, maintain stream temperature um, at, at a cooler at a cooler temperature for these salmon. Thanks.